Thank you all for coming out. I just drove here with my wife from Amherst, and it's a little frustrating because it's a really pretty drive. But I had to imagine that it was a pretty drive for much of the way. Thanks for giving me the chance to discuss a topic which is at the core of my next book, the one I'm getting started on right now. Early this century, the U.S. Census Bureau crunched the numbers and predicted that in 2043, a significant threshold would be crossed. Somewhere in this enormous country, a child would be born, a very significant child. We'll never know for sure where she or he is, who she or he is, but with that delivery, the number of Americans who trace their ancestry to Africa, Asia, and Latin America will outnumber the Americans who trace their ancestry to Europe. Demographers began to call it majority-minority America. A big deal, for sure. Like Virginia Dare becoming the first white girl born in what is now the United States. I want to begin your thinking about tonight's topic getting ready for the next America by reminding you first of a cold November evening in Chicago. The results were in. In Phoenix, one candidate had conceded he had not won the election. And an enormous, happy crowd thronged Grant Park on the Chicago lakefront. And onto a specially built stage walked a newly minted president-elect his wife, and their young daughters. The anchors working that night reflected, almost sounding like they had to pinch themselves, that the United States of America was going to have a black president. People cheered, people wept. There was a feeling that we had crossed an important threshold, gotten over a big historic hump. Maybe you remember that night a cutaway from the stage, a close-up of Reverend Jesse Jackson with tears streaming down his face. Okay, hold that moment in your head. Then let's fast forward to Charlottesville, Virginia, home of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, home of the University of Virginia, and home to statues of Confederate generals. Brandishing torches bought from the Home Depot, a large crowd, almost all men, all white men, marched around a statue of Robert E. Lee and chanted, you will not replace us, and more ominously, Jews will not replace us. If you try to imagine a Venn diagram with the cheering, weeping, ecstatic crowd in Chicago, and the aggrieved, angry crowd in Charlottesville, I'm going to take a wild guess that there was very little overlap in that <laughs> Venn diagram. The crowd on election night saw a president, the son of an African man and a white American woman, his own wife, a black American woman whose ancestors were enslaved in the American South, a president-elect with an Indonesian-American half-sister, married to a Canadian-born man of Chinese descent, a president-elect who had spent years of his childhood outside the United States, was not raised in any religion, in demographic terms, a man who walked across the stage with a family that told us something in the moment about the century to come. And that crowd, both there in Grant Park, but also across the country watching television, was not afraid, for the most part, of what Obama, Barack Obama represented in the 21st century United States. The crowd in Charlottesville, marching around the statue of a 19th century hero erected in the early 20th century, was worried in the 21st about being replaced, worried about its place in an America shaped, transformed even, 
by post-1965 immigration, a cosmopolitan, multicultural country where the primacy of European-descended Americans would not be automatically assumed in all contexts, in all times, in all places. I'm not neurotic about this stuff, but I watch it closely. Always keep an eye on popular culture, advertising, entertainment television, movie heroes, the ephemera that a culture like ours throws out like sparks in great profusion. There's code hidden in these pieces of cultural production. Without ever saying explicitly, here's what we mean, these items send little electric charges, tiny bits of current that whisper, pay attention, pay attention. When I was a child in the early 60s, there were virtually no black people on television. Think about it. Taking a quick look at the crowd, a lot of you remember what I'm talking about. <laughs> the only Latinos I can recall seeing were a real life person, Desi Arnaz, playing a fictional version of himself, and the little burro sidekick, Baba Louie, who often broke the fourth wall and spoke directly to the audience about the troubles of his often misguided boss, the headstrong horse slash sheriff, Quick Draw McGraw. That was pretty much it. The 50s managed to fill my screen with reruns. If you tuned away from the network-owned stations, the Cisco Kid and his comic sidekick, Pancho, the kid was played by Gilbert Rowland, who was Mexican, and Duncan Ronaldo, who was not. Uh, Zorro, oddly the story of Mexican California. So both the good guys and the bad guys were Mexican in Zorro. But Zorro was played by Douglas Fairbanks, Robert Livingston, Tyrone Power, Guy Williams, whose family came to the United States from Sicily, John Hadley, doesn't sound very Mexican to me, John Hadley, and Frank Langella. A long line of actors stretching from the roaring 20s all the way to the 21st century until nearly after a century of on-screen Zorros, he's finally played by an actual Spanish speaker, but not a Mexican. I think that would almost be too much to ask for. Antonio Banderas plays the young Zorro, not the real Zorro, but his protege. The real Zorro is played by Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> Nat King Cole had a nationally televised network television show on Monday nights, briefly, aired by NBC in a fairly daring move for a national programmer. During the run, Cole's show featured Mel Torme, Peggy Lee, Harry Belafonte, Ella Fitzgerald, Eartha Kitt, Tony Bennett, Frankie Lane, the murderer's row of American pop music in 1957. Basically the chart-topping stars of the music scene. But that program, in its entire run, did not attract a single national advertiser. When Cole closed down production at the end of 1957, he joked, Madison Avenue is afraid of the dark. <laughs> Black people could not sell products to a national audience well into the 1960s, while white people sold everything, food, car, gasoline, insurance, soft drinks, toys, and they sold them to everybody. Now, you may hear that and think, oh, that's crazy, but black people bought all those things. They were a sizable American market. Sure, you're right when you say that, but you're only half right. Advertisers weren't ignoring the fact that black people bought things. They knew that. But advertisers believed that white characters in televised spots, distributed and shown to all, were operating on the assumption that all people could see themselves and their desires in the white people who wanted cleaner clothes and 
spotless dishes and softer hands and a closer shave and better gasoline. It was not necessary to show the broad variety of American humanity to all buyers. White people could see their humanity modeled constantly. The rest of us had to make do. But they also believed that unlike in 2018, when the smooth baritone of Dennis Haysbert, that guy has the best pipes going, reminds insurance buyers that they're in good hands with Allstate, that white buyers could not see their humanity modeled by others. That was the core assumption of an all-white world of advertising. Those of you who were alive back then, think of who sold what to whom. Even as black celebrities began to appear in ads because their fame could transcend their color, athletes, recording artists, actors, of all the products an African American was likely to sell a general audience, financial products would have been pretty far-fetched. Banking, financial planning, a stockbroker, insurance. It was the inability of non-white people to act as avatars, to represent the humanity and the consuming desire of the entire audience, the assumed inability of white Americans to see their humanity modeled in ordinary people of other origins, that made advertising more than entertainment television a sign of what we value and what we fear. So on Sunday night, Flip Wilson could say, stay tuned, we'll be back after this, and you'd go to, from a show with a black host to an all-white series of characters in the advertising. Demographer William Fry of the Brookings Institution, in his terrific recent book, Diversity Explosion, I recommend it to you, explores the way patterns of migration, birth, and death are shaping the American population. Even if you grab a yard torch from a home store and march around a Confederate bronze general, even if you help an American president try to send large numbers of long-term residents back to where they came from and let fewer new people in at the same time, the demographic cake is baked. It's too late. You're just nibbling around the edges, really. We can fiddle with the numbers. That non-white Virginia Dare might be born in 2045 or 2048 or 2050, but labor is gonna begin and delivery is gonna happen. <laughs> and the America created by the 1965 rewrite of the immigration laws will finally, truly, and fully be here. Not if, but when. And let me make clear, it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. And really, it's what you make of it that's going to tell the tale. An event created by tremendous change, wrought in the world by the violent winds of the 20th century. World War, Holocaust, decolonization, Cold War. If it's happening, spending too much time and psychic energy trying to make it not happen is going to be a waste of time. It's math. If it's happening, defining it as a calamity is not a particularly useful response because it's coming anyway. Since it paints you into an emotional and political corner and it narrows the ranges of possible responses to a very different but maybe not so different America. The country began as a string of lightly populated colonies hugging the Atlantic coast of what's now the United States, and people have been coming here, adding to the cultural and genetic diversity from the earliest days of the colonies, and the young independent republic as well. Dutch traders, French Protestants, Spanish and Portuguese speaking Jews in search of a safe harbor, Swedes and Scots in the mid-Atlantic, English religious radicals in the Northeast, Irish Protestants and Irish Catholics after the rebellion of 1798. German-speaking religious minorities, a wide variety of Europeans who found things untenable at home and knew there would be less of a fuss in New Orleans, Philadelphia, New York, or Newport. 
and a lot of available farmland stretching west from the coastline. I would not for a moment exaggerate the ease with which these very different people became Americans, because in many cases it wasn't that easy, and they were not welcome. But time did the trick more than anything else. Time in country and the presence of racial others. Native people and people brought to the young country in captivity from Africa helped create a notion of in-groups and out-groups unique to this country. So you knew who you were by what you were not. Europeans continued to come. In the mid-19th century, Middle European revolutions brought German speakers in profusion, political refugees now adding to the more heavily religious ones of earlier flows, the Irish famine, European wars, an open door on this side of the Atlantic, and a gradual swing from North and West Europe to South and East Europe as the century progressed brought new people, Poles, Lithuanians, Romanians, Czechs, Italians, South Slavs, Serbs, and Croatians. The country was becoming more Catholic, more Orthodox, more Jewish than it had ever been before, but was still home to an enormous Protestant majority. And though we didn't know it then, because conceptions of race were very different in the 19th century, it was becoming home to an overwhelming white majority. I tell you all this to set the table for the 20th century, a century that would be very concerned about immigration, about who's an American, who gets to set the terms, who acts as the self-appointed gatekeeper to a fuzzy, constantly changing, and sometimes capricious definition of who is us and who is not us. After roughly 75 years of one of the largest human migrations in history, the flow of human beings to North America from Europe from the mid-19th century until just after the First World War, Americans were co concluding in a way that was politically significant that they had had enough. As they looked over the past 20 plus years, policymakers had overseen the carrying of the American flag to far flung possessions in the Philippines, Guam, and Hawaii, US domination of Cuba without annexation, and the absorption of Puerto Rico into the American empire. The World War, the Great War, saw the US step further out onto the international stage the decade that also saw the highest percentage of foreign-born residents ever to live in the United States, that decade from 1910 to 1920. So when the post-war Congresses came to Washington, they decided it was time to narrow the door a great deal. A new quota system for new arrivals was put in place that did a curious thing. It sought not only to favor Europeans by having the profile of future immigrant flows resemble that of the European-born people already in the country. That would have been one thing, but they didn't even do that. They looked back 30 years to the foreign-born population of 1890 as the template to dictate future levels of immigration. So if, for example, the foreign-born population of the United States in 1890 was 5% Dutch, 5% of annual arrivals in the future could now be Dutch. If 18% of all foreign-born residents in 1890 were born in Ireland, these Congresses of the 1920s decided that future arrivals could be 18% Irish. By looking that far back, the quotas not only artificially favored Europeans, but certain kinds of Europeans. Since Southern and Eastern European migrations, Jews from the Tsarist Empire, Italians from Naples and Sicily, Mexicans who came in large numbers during the 1910 Civil War, would not count as heavily because they used a date from before those very large arrivals. 
They didn't just come up with 1890 by accident, folks. There was great anxiety in certain circles about the rising power of organized labor, the rising influence of an immigrant left, heavily fueled by new arrivals and foreign born. Look at those sepia photographs of marches in Union Square in Lower Manhattan. All the signs people carrying are in Yiddish and Italian. Not for the passers-by, I assure you. From the early 1920s on, there would be more clamping down on foreign ideologies, greater suspicion of activists, spearheaded in part by a young federal agency, the FBI, founded in 1908 and starting in 1924, led by an energetic young director named John Edgar Hoover. Events have a way of surprising us. Policy outcomes end up being very different from what drafters of a bill might have in mind. Just a few years after the rewrite of America's immigration formulas, the stock market crashed, worldwide depression began, immigration slowed to a trickle. The US even sent back hundreds of thousands of immigrants in the Southwest to Mexico, picked them up, put them on trains, put them on trucks, and drove them back to Mexico. Not just Mexican nationals, but tens of thousands of US citizens who were dependents, family members, or simply vacuumed up in sweeps and assumed to be foreign born. Following the Depression came the Second World War, and again, immigration cratered. And during the decades of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the people who came from Dublin and Palermo and Warsaw and Vilnius in the 1880s and 1890s and the early years of the 20th century were dying. Their native-born children stepped forward, assimilated, acculturated, and widely accepted, widely understood to be part of us. The number of foreign-born Americans sharply declines by the end of the 1950s, and Europe's post-war economic miracle, aided by the Marshall Plan and fear of Soviet incursion, meant fewer people wanted to move here from Italy, from Belgium, from Holland, from Britain. Nobody was going to flee destitution in the countries that had once sent people streaming across the Atlantic because destitution was drying up and it was tough to get here from behind the Iron Curtain. So America's Eurocentric quota-based system, based on the 1890 population, was unworkable, a relic, no longer a reflection of workforce needs or who wanted to come here and from where. So the rules were rewritten in 1965, co-sponsored by Senator Philip Hart of Michigan, Representative Emanuel Seller of Brooklyn, and championed and sold on the floor of the Senate by a young fella named Edward Kennedy, first term senator from Massachusetts. They did away with the Emergency Quota Act of 1921. They ended the so-called National Origins Formula that was part of that earlier legislation. And America was now, in a real way, open to the world. People came from the Philippines and China, from the Middle, Be Middle East, the Caribbean, and Central America. Sikh gurdwaras, mosques, and Buddhist and Hindu temples rose in metropolitan areas. The Catholic Church got a demographic shot in the arm from large numbers of Spanish speakers from the rest of the hemisphere, and the country began to change. What we ate, what we heard on the radio, who did different jobs, everything moved into motion in a place where the economy was growing swiftly, so nobody complained. Now, 50 years later, the 50th anniversary of the full enactment of the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act is this coming June. We are living in Teddy Kennedy's America, living in the America reshaped by Hart, Seller, and Kennedy. And in case you haven't noticed, not everyone is happy. 
Representative King of Iowa questions whether DACA recipients are more likely drug mules or high school valedictorians. He says these young people are, quote, undermining our culture and civilization. The president goes out of his way to imply, he has to imply because the facts are actually against him, that much of America's urban crime, which has been falling for the last 20 years, not rising as he says, is caused by illegal immigrants who, we've long known, commit serious crimes at a lower rate than their native-born peers. And these are important elected officials. They're not shadowy figures running white supremacist websites or trafficking in insults and denigration behind pseudonyms. Last year, Congressman King suggested during an interview that large numbers of undocumented people have to be sent home because, quote, you can't rebuild a civilization using somebody else's children. Well, South African-born Elon Musk of Tesla, and Russian-born Sergey Brin of Google, and Turkish Kurd Hamdi Ulukaya, the wildly successful creator and founder of Chobani Yogurt, and Costa Rican-born NASA astronaut Franklin Chang, are their kids somebody else's children or our children? Senator Tammy Duckworth, born in Bangkok to a Thai mother and an American father? Is she who Representative King is talking about? Grievously wounded in the Iraq war, leaving the army as a lieutenant colonel, now a United States senator? We've been rebuilding American civilization with somebody else's children for 175 years. Medicine, motion pictures, Silicon Valley, the Roeblings in the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge, Charles Proteus Steinmetz in the building of General Electric, Gordon Moore and the fabulous Intel processor. For a time in the American South, one third of all doctors working in rural areas were immigrants from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, or the children of immigrants from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. I understand, but I do not sympathize with the anguish, the unease, the anxiety that's, a, that's accompanying this slow transition to the next America. That night in Grant Park in Chicago, it seemed like it was going to be a lot easier. Then suddenly it didn't look so easy anymore. But immigrants pick your crops, bust your tables, Take your vital signs, drive your cabs, kill your chickens, kill your pigs, kill your cows, take your order, lay your sod, tape your drywall, watch your babies, bathe your elderly parents, serve in your military, attend your universities, the private ones and the public ones. They open businesses, they bring down the rising median age of a resident of this country, and they, at least, still have babies. <laughs> I'm out of the baby-making business. I'm going to guess many of you are as well. And that means there'll be workers paying into FICA to top up your Social Security check. We Americans tend to downplay how hard it is to leave the place where you were born, the place where everything you knew in life was, and start from scratch somewhere else on the planet. But we also tend to get very strenuous about counting the costs of having people here, and more than a little lax about counting the profits. The image that drives nativists crazy, the one you'll often hear in these debates of wards, maternity wards in public hospitals full of immigrants in labor, of kindergarten kids, kindergarten classes full of kids learning English as a second language. These are the nightmare scenarios for those people. They toss and turn in their sheets, and then their beds are made by an immigrant. My taxes, my taxes and your taxes pay the added costs of people who would not otherwise be giving birth to little citizens. That's true, absolutely. And we pay to educate those kids when they hit four and five years old, a cost we wouldn't have ever had to bear if their parents weren't here. That's true, too. But the benefits 
of cheaper food, cheaper restaurant meals, of new homes that were cheap to buy and plentiful in the years before the housing crash, of the costs of services that did not rise year after year after year as fast as inflation, of ratios of working people to retired people that will get out of whack more slowly. Those entries on the other side of the bookkeeping ledger end up being a little harder to count, but no less real. For a long time, the debate over immigration had one commonplace riff. It went something like this. I'm not complaining about legal immigration, mind you. We're a nation of immigrants. It's just the illegal immigration that bothers me. And I don't know if you've been paying close attention. I don't know if you've been listening to elected officials from around the country. But now that obligatory caveat, that once required asterisk moment, is in decline as the president urged on by Stephen Miller and Steve Bannon and other advisors encourage an already emboldened president to speculate about not having to give immigrants from so-called shithole countries, pardon the expression, and yearning for more arrivals from Norway. <laughs> Fewer from Africa and Latin America. Now let's take a look at Norway for a moment. <laughs> Longer life expectancy, better health care, higher average income, more years of schooling, higher literacy rate, better support for the elderly after retirement. Well, you can see why people would be jumping on boats in Bergen and Stavanger to get here as quickly as possible. I'm not sure, other than the weather, why anybody would move from Norway to here, but a strong hint of the preference for some immigrants and not others has now crept into the discourse, using the idea of formulas like those employed in Canada and Australia to limit low-skilled labor flows, and extolled and celebrated inside policy circles. It's not just the president. His rhetoric in this area is an effect, not a cause. The showdown over confederal, Confederate battle monuments is a symptom not a cause. A more diverse country, home to a large number of people from Asia, Africa, and Latin America who subscribe to American values is not something that's hoped for by the millions of Americans who now believe and tell pollsters every year that white people are the most discriminated against members of society. A study recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences has political scientist Diana Mutz arguing that all the ink spilled about white voters and Donald Trump in 2016 that placed the cause of their unease in economic anxiety were way off base. The big Donald Trump vote came from households making between 70 and $100,000. So reporters dutifully troop off to the Youngstowns and the Akrons and the Savickleys in western Pennsylvania, and they talk to downtrodden, unemployed West Virginia miners. That's not where it's at. It's probably a good experience for them to go to these places. Don't get me wrong. But this was not about economic anxiety. That wasn't what led millions of voters, better off voters, to vote for the president. Professor Mutz says it was status threat, concern about who was going to be top dog in a future America after eight years of Barack Obama. It was racial anxiety of the kind that I've been talking about, a fear that after two centuries of being numerically superior, that they would no longer be the sole and undisputed agenda setters, no longer the people who never had to imagine themselves in other people's shoes because their shoes were the only ones that mattered. I began talking about advertising. It's that relatability that advertising stands on 
that's central here. Can you, the customer, the consumer of the media message, see yourself in the shared humanity of a woman who has a dirty kitchen floor? No matter what kind of woman she is, is it the kitchen floor that you can identify with? Who, in a commercial shown at 11 a.m., is dealing with a sick kid who has to stay home from school? Who needs to choose a brand of female sanitary product? In the old days, the marketplace was more uniformly white. The recipient of the messages was more uniformly white. And these naughty problems of imaginary proxies, who do I see myself in, was similar. But then, as now, every person in an ethnic or racial minority was asked morning, noon, and night to project themselves into the imagination, the taste, the desires of white people, to see these proxies as the unquote average person. You yourself were not an average person, and you had few illusions about that, which I, why I see these ads as social text, coal mine canaries, a sample in real time of something big that's happening right under our noses. Today, there are same-sex couples in ads. Could you have imagined that in the 1960s? There are mixed-race couples, and there are biracial children in ads. And what's interesting about that for me is that advertising has to work hard at being immediately readable, relatable, and not offensive. And I'm old enough to remember a world where the idea that a same-sex couple could sell a car, or a home product, or kids' clothes would have been unimaginable because it would be assumed that the very presence of a same-sex couple would be unimaginable. Now I see ads for a beach vacation with a gorgeous couple strolling idyllically along the beach. One partner is white and the other one is black and I shake my head in wonder. The cat is out of the bag. That part of the argument seems to be over. It turns out there were some people who were angry and they wrote to General Mills to complain about the Cheerios commercial with a black dad and his biracial daughter. But that number is either a steady state fraction, a dwell point of American adults who feel that way, and it's not going to expand, it's only going to contract. In that sense, the next America is already here. To the eye of the public, this is no big deal. The kid's cute. The father's handsome. After all, this is still a TV ad. <laughs> but their racial status is unremarkable. The only thing that's remarkable as far as the image engineers of this commercial are concerned is that you want Cheerios. <laughs> but if you want to declare the game over, the battles won for a different kind of America, and go home and watch Modern Family, or Blackish, or This Is Us, not so fast. Not everybody's on board. Not everybody thinks this is so great. We're on the cusp of 25 years of wrestling and argument and adjustment about what this is all going to mean. Shifting political power, shifting cultural influence, and an ongoing drama in the battleground between our ears, the battleground of our imaginations over what America is, over who America's for, who's an American, and who gets to say so. The president's close advisor, Stephen Miller, is whispering one view, view of the future in Donald Trump's ear. And as a 71-year-old man whose cultural imagination was forged in a small mansion in an all-white neighborhood in Queens, where one set of racial and cultural interests clearly came first, and that was undisputed, that's one version of the future created in the post-1965 America. The accident of history created a world where the grandchildren 
and great-grandchildren of people from Lithuania and Poland and Palermo complain about people from Caracas and Korea, wring their hands about the number of people from Manila and Michoacan. They are convinced that once upon a time, we pulled off the great trick of making Americans out of people from everywhere, but it's something that we just can't do again. After a long period of shared civic pride about this country not being bound together by shared blood and origin, not bound together by shared tribe, shared religion, shared origin story, like other nations in the world, let's face it, but bound together by shared values. Today, a portion of our people have convinced themselves, literally, that that was then and this is now. And the nasty little lurking detail about that great tide of humanity from Killarney and Kiev was at the end of the day, they were all white even though we didn't think of it in that way then. So that the children of an Irish Catholic from Killarney had more in common with the children of a Ukrainian Catholic from Kiev. In fact, today they marry each other because they were all white. But I don't understand this tidal wave of people from South Asia, from Mexico and Central America, from West Africa, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, let me bring you a dispatch from the future. Tomorrow's grandmas aren't going to be overjoyed at the prospect of some of their precious grandchildren marrying across some of these lines either. Just like today's grandmas sometimes have trouble with it. But you can't control who your grandkids are comfortable around, share a common humanity with, and, oh yeah, this matters too, who they think are really cute. <laughs> but for today, the shared values argument seems no longer to be enough. There are people fretting about a fractured American future, convinced that diversity is not a strength, that all that old eyewash about American diversity was a lot of hooey, stuff we told ourselves in July 4th speeches, and not the stuff of the nasty, ugly wrestling match for resources and jobs and neighborhoods and school districts that goes on in America day after day. A country where students at the elementary school you attended now need bilingual ed teachers. A country where counter employees don't speak good English. Where jobs that once reliably paid middle class salaries don't anymore because we've let too many people in. Tucker Carlson recently had a show on Fox where he posited that people are inclined to be accepting, inclined to be open-minded, inclined to adjust, but they can't when you ask them to do it too quickly, in too short a time. Then they can't handle it. And that's why middle Americans are angry and upset. And he used the example of Hazleton, Pennsylvania. But he could have used any number of cities across the mid-Atlantic and northeast. He points out that a nearly all-white town transitioned to being a Latino-majority town in a very short stretch of years. And he's right. That happened. What Tucker Carlson failed to mention is that before the arrival of this new Latino population in a small, deindustrializing city in eastern Pennsylvania, European-descended white people were leaving in droves. Hazleton's population was way down from its post-war highs in the second half of the 20th century. In other words, longtime residents of the city were bailing out already and had been for a long time. So were these new people, quote unquote, displacing old residents? Chasing them away as the social anxiety theory goes? Or were they merely attracted by lower cost real estate, lower rentals on storefronts on the commercial street, and helping to revive a place whose fortunes had been in long-term decline? The new Dominican population of Hazleton, 
like the Puerto Rican population in Allentown and Bethlehem, was finding New York too expensive, and before the precipitous drop in crime, also too dangerous. So they pulled up stakes and looked for a place where they could afford their homes after lifetimes of renting apartments. They looked for places that might have newer and less overcrowded middle schools. In effect, Tucker Carlson was knitting his brows and lamenting the fact that Dominicans could do what Americans have been doing ever since the end of the Second World War, hitting the road in search of opportunity. At the time that this started, the mayor of Hazleton was a guy named Lou Barletta. I guarantee you the Barlettas were not long-term natives of eastern Pennsylvania. So at some point, at some point, some Barletta grandfather had to move in from somewhere else and take the place of the Czech or Slovak or Serb who was living in Hazleton before him, and oh my God, but we forget so quickly. We forget so easily what an old story this is. Hazleton could have continued its downward slide into shared oblivion with those other post-industrial towns, but instead, those terrible Latinos who never learn English and move in too fast mean you have somebody to sell your house to when your own children and your own grandchildren don't want it. On this particular night on the Fox News Channel, what had been happening in America for generations, one kind of people moving out and another kind moving in, was suddenly made to seem creepy, hard to handle, un-American. It turns out there are multiple Americas. There's the America of real people doing real things in real time, and there's the America of the stories we tell each other. In the real America, our immigrant grandparents or great-grandparents often topped out at broken English. That was about as good as it was going to get. But our grandparents perhaps continued to speak to them in the home language and spoke to the world outside the apartment in English. In the America of the stories we tell each other, they learned English right away. Or heroically, somehow, taught it to themselves on the boat coming over. In the America of the stories we tell each other, today's immigrants never learn English or don't want to learn English. In the America of reality, Today's immigrants are acquiring English at a rate similar to other immigrants from other places in other times in our history and have no doubt that their children must learn it to make their way in America. We know a lot, in fact, about a century of language acquisition in this country. What's the single most influential variable on your eventual English proficiency. The age you were when you moved to the United States is the single most influential variable. So if great grandpa came at 30, he spoke one way. If grandpa came at five or eight, grandma came at 10, it's another story. That America of shared values rather than shared blood is going to be put to the test in the next quarter century. If the president's proposals for changing who comes here and who gets to stay get put into effect, it will postpone that demographic threshold of minority-majority status, but it will not cancel that day. That's already baked into the cake. The population that's already here who has more kids and who has fewer, which populations are concentrated in childbearing years and which ones are not, it's too late to change that stuff. That next America is coming. 
We have no control over that. What we do get to determine, and what's in our hands, is what the years of that transition are going to be like. We can get comfortable with our future selves, try not to be rebels against the future, and make that the best America with the raw material we've got to work with. Or we can make this harder. We can make it a lot harder. And don't doubt for a second that these coming years don't have the potential to be ugly, hard fought, and in the final analysis, pointlessly filled with conflict and dissension. A few years ago, when, as they are in so many seasons, the San Antonio Spurs were in the NBA Finals. The Star Spangled Banner was sung to open the game, as it's always sung at an NBA championship game. On this particular evening in San Antonio, stepping out into the spotlight was a 13-year-old musician, Sebastián de la Cruz. He stepped up to half court, dressed, in a resplendent silver and black mariachi outfit, custom made, of course, in the San Antonio Spurs colors. And he sang the national anthem in perfect, unaccented, standard American English. The Twitterverse went berserk with one central complaint. Why couldn't the Spurs get an American to sing the national anthem? As I look at the coming decades, that's one future where a kid born and raised in a city that started life as a Spanish mission, in a city that was Spanish, then Mexican for 200 years, then American for the next 150, can't be accepted by other Americans as part of themselves. Sebastian is us. He's part of us. He's part of our story. He's part of our history, just like San Antonio is. That conferring of permanent foreignness on young Sebastian is not some fluky, marginal thing. It's part of the idea that will fuel coming conflict, fuel the wrestling match, continue to give Tucker Carlson and the residents, the white residents of Hazleton, anxiety, continue to give the English speaker at the counter of a CVS in Hialeah, Florida, fits as she tries to pick up a prescription. Continue to give oxygen to a president who seems either to realize all too well or not realize at all that he's playing with social dynamite. We have before us choices about what kind of country we're going to be. As an individual citizen, I don't get to make the choice. I've got a 50-50 chance of living to see the day when America makes that shift into its 2.0 future, its post-1965 next reality. For America's sake, I hope we conclude that we've got to hold fast to the values I was raised to believe are core American values and not be distracted by the guys with torches chanting something about blood and soil. The president says some of them are lovely people. <laughs> Personally, I don't think any of them are lovely people. <laughs> For my own part, I want to hope that many of them will have a change of heart. I don't know how many will. But we do control that future. We get a vote. We get a vote about how hard or easy this change is going to be. I hope you make the right choice. Thanks for having me with you tonight. Everything you said was perfect. <laughs> However, <laughs> we do have the re reality of a very powerful and well-funded radical right who 
who control the media, at least Fox, which most people watch. So please comment on how we can have a happy ending the way you described as opposed to what it appears it will be. Happier. Um, time takes care of some of this. Uh, when I was writing my first book, uh, the, my local Catholic church on the northwest side of Chicago was kind enough to give me access to their archives. And I watched as a neighborhood uh, that was built by Poles and Scandinavians gradually became a Puerto Rican neighborhood. And you see it in the annual pictures of First Holy Communion, and you see it in the annual banquet for the ushers, and year after year after year, it happens slowly, it happens um, gradually, from one photo to another, it happens almost imperceptibly, but then when you look at the photo from 1960 and the one from 1975, oh yeah, you realize how far you got. Shared institutions, shared love of these institutions and valuing of them, uh, reminds people that the most important thing in that particular context that they had in common was not where, they're, where they came from, but that they both loved this church. And, you know, play that example out through thousands of contexts, thousands of neighborhoods, thousands of institutions across the country. Um, it's already happening in a lot of places. It's granted, it is ugly and difficult and hard for people in some places, and I, I don't want to minimize that. But if you rail against this future, it won't accomplish anything. It's coming, so let's find the best way to do it. We've done it before. It's not like this isn't an old American story. All the change is the cast of characters. Part of the problem is we know our history, our own history, so poorly. We teach history. We understand our own past so badly. Americans, OK, I, do I want to be like Bosnia, where the combatants were yelling slogans from a 14th century battle? Their problem is they never forget anything. <laughs> But that doesn't make never remembering anything OK either. I'm, so, I'm sure there's some middle point which makes our history utile uh, between you know, the, the battle of the field of blood, where people are yelling at each other about long dead ancestors and their conflicts with each other. I think we can do better than Bosnians, and I think we can do better than we've done as a people so far. Uh, that valorization of Ellis Island immigrants that sits weirdly and paradoxically side by side with the disdain for today's immigrants is just weird. That's just weird. The assumption that y your grandparents from Cork had more in common with somebody's somebody's grandparents from Thessalonica, because they're both white, is ridiculous. They are as much strangers to each other, that person from regional, a regional provincial Greek town and Cork, as somebody from Sweden and, and uh, Palermo, as, as much as somebody from uh, Yellowknife, Canada, and San Antonio. To imagine that they're somehow closer to each other for some imaginary melanin-based reason <laughs> is just kind of bizarre. And it wasn't easy for those people always to get along. And it wasn't e always easy for them to share social space and share institutions. And there was wrestling, and there was elbows out, and there was uh, wrestling over who would control these places. But, you know, we got over it after a while. We just don't remember it. And that's unfortunate. Thanks for a very stimulating speech. My great-great-grandfather was from Hazleton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he probably got pushed out by Dominicans. I'm coming, coming from Lithuania. <laughs> you know, you speak about uh, why can't we embrace our common values and people coming from other cultures should be seen as and again, but most of us in this room are not African-American. In fact, almost none of us. 
and the culture that was slaves that came bound in chains on ships from Africa did not fit with our values into the, into the values of the Constitution. They were not equal. They were not given opportunity. The indigenous American peoples that we exterminated in this country certainly have real question about what values they should share with us as opposed to joining in our values. So the mainstream values that you tout, and I, I hold them, I think it's very important, have really closed off major groups. How do you respond to that? It's an undeniable fact that in law, as well as in social custom, black Americans were not allowed to share a common humanity with their fellow residents of this country because they weren't citizens until the 14th Amendment was ratified. They weren't fully citizens until the 14th Amendment was ratified. Um, but once the frontier was closed and the 19th century turned into the 20th, the table was pretty much set in geographical terms, largely in population terms. We knew what we had to play with. There's been some refining and tinkering across the years as new laws have been layered onto the old to expand the franchise, to expand the access to rights, to expand the access to a common humanity. The great genius of the United States is not that we get things right, right away, all the time. It's that we have repairable institutions that over time eventually do get things right. You know how many wars have been fought in societies that can't do that? Where people are at each other's throats because they don't have self-repairing institutions. It's the great genius of this country that we've managed somehow, with one major exception, don't get me wrong, the worst bloodletting in American history, but one major exception, to figure out ways to continue to open the access to a shared humanity without going to war with each other. Um, that should give all of us, no matter where we're situated on these various continuums, a lot of hope, because we do eventually figure it out and we do eventually have a tendency to get it right. Um, you know, there's a reason why France is on its fifth republic. In the time that France has had five republics, we've had one. Uh, so I, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about this, really, I don't. But I think that um, we've managed the trick better than people all over the world have. And it is selling ourselves short to suddenly say, OK, as of this date, we can't manage the trick anymore. We've somehow lost the thread. We've lost the talent. Uh, we've lost the wit uh, for that kind of accommodation. What it takes is constantly reminding ourselves about that fact that we are a people that's never been united by common origin, never but always by um, shared interest in the, the words of the Constitution, by a certain shared go-getiveness that I think has marked American life uh, in, in all its crazy, perverse splendor for a long time. You go to other places in the world, they're not like that. They're not filled with people who were dying to get in to those other countries and start from nothing. They're just not. So if you're in a muffler shop on Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn, and all the workers are Pakistani, there are no muffler shops in Karachi filled with Brooklyn workers who went to get started at the bottom and work their way up. There aren't people banging down the doors trying to get into a lot of other countries in the world. They know this about America, and they're even willing to take the hazing that comes at the front end. I always liken it to a house where you arrive and you bang on the front door and they let you in and they beat you up at the front door, but by the time you get back to the back of the first floor, they're eating your food. Um, and that's what we've done again and again and again, and I think we haven't lost the knack. We've just lost our zest for it or something, but we need to, we need to get that back. Mr. Suarez, I wanted to ask you a question pertaining to the impact 
of the economic reality we live in today. Um, it is said that elections are decided because people vote with their pocketbooks. And if you look back to 1979 and just take that point, there's been so much inequality in America. Average wages have gone down. Productivity has gone down. Those with, with a high school education or less have seen the real income decline. I think that may be a factor that's leading to some of the situations and the reality that you talked about. Could you comment on that? I would disagree with you in your um, preamble to point out that, in fact, productivity hasn't gone down. Um, productivity soared, and the way we distribute the profits from that productivity has changed drastically in those intervening years. So that uh, someone who is expected to be as productive or more productive than they were uh, earlier in their careers actually make less spendable money because we've distributed the gains from productivity upward through stock dividends, through a lower uh, tax burden on income and on profits. Uh, we have somehow uh, created in the interest of one set of Americans who earn money certain kinds of ways, um, a couple of different classes of money. Our tax code has decided that earning money in certain ways is preferable, uh, more valor-filled, um, more to be encouraged than other ways of earning money. So if you just put on your pants in the morning and go earn a wage, your income is treated in one way, uh, where if you invest the money, your income is treated in another way. It's taxed at a lower rate. Why? Is income not income not income? Worker's income is somehow you know, more fingerable than, than, uh, than investor's income? And when you decide to do that, when you move as, uh, as strongly in that direction as we have as a country, uh, valorizing investing over work, valorizing certain kinds of wage earning over others, when you tell a hedge fund manager that uh, the money that he makes for managing other people's money is somehow not like the money of the guy who drove him to work, you're saying something about what you think work is, and you're saying something about how we should treat the proceeds from that work. Inequality uh, is something that we engineered into the system. That year that you used, 1979, that was a time where we treated profits and dividends and various kinds of uh, investment income more like the income that's earned from going and doing a job and getting paid to do it. In the years since then, as productivity has soared and we've figured out all kinds of corners in the tax code to hide things like stock options that vest down the road, which deliver uh, just unimaginable windfalls of money to certain kinds of workers and not others, not others who work in many of their same enterprises. Uh, we've lowered the top tax rates. We've lowered the top, top tax rates. I keep hearing the argument that the reason we lowered them is because we want to encourage people to make money. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Believe me. The Rockefellers wanted to make money. And nothing that happened between 1912 and the Reagan Revolution discouraged them from wanting to make money. And not just the Rockefellers. You know, the, the who's who on the, on the Forbes 500. Rich people during the Kennedy and Johnson administration when marginal tax rates were high, they still wanted to be rich, and they wanted to be richer. Even though their profits were taxed very heavily, they still wanted to be rich. It was baloney then, it is baloney now that rich people are discouraged from earning more money 
by having to pay taxes. I'm richer than I ever thought I was going to be. I've been a very lucky guy. I've had a wonderful, amazing American life that started in very modest circumstances, and now I'm wearing a very expensive suit. <laughs> there was no point where I said, I'm not going to make that money. I'm going to have to pay taxes on that money. I'll just be OK with the money I have, thank you. Never, not once. So inequality has been engineered more aggressively into the system over the past 25 years by our tax regimes, by the kind of economic behavior that we encourage and the kind of economic behavior that we discourage. And if we lie to ourselves and tell, us that that's, tell ourselves that that's not happening and then fret about inequality, we're being really disingenuous. Amen. The, the people who... <laughs> Now we're in, a, we're in a new time of innovation, which is great. People are inventing things, and they do and should get rich from the things that they innovate and the things that out of their wit and creativity they create. That's fabulous. But the kings of the American economy are people who engineer money, not people who engineer productivity. They've never invented a thing. They've never invented a single process for making a product better or more useful or more profitable to sell. They've never invented a single thing that makes our lives better and more enjoyable. All they've done is figure out ways to take the matrix of the tax code and shape their behavior to what's incentivized by that code and what's disincentivized in order to keep the maximum amount, amount of money in their pocket. So, you know, I, it's the system. We play with the cards we're dealt. We live in the world we live in. That's the way it goes. I'm glad that all of you, when you finally decide to pull up stakes and sell out of here, will be able to exclude, if you're still married, $500,000 from capital gains taxes. Swell. As they said in my neighborhood, you should live and be well. But let's not kid ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves that that's some sort of gift because we're good people. That's something that's been engineered into the tax code by lobbying and pressure on Congress members and pressure on political candidates. And you create a system where holding and investing money in certain ways is treated in some ways so that you held a house for 15 years or 20 years, so you get to exclude, what, $500,000 of profit from tax? All right, that's the law, and you will do it, and that's fine. But let's not pretend that that's something for everybody, something that the tax code did for everybody, that after debates in Congress in a country where the average home sold for $118,000, that excluding $500,000 of profit from tax was something that they did for everybody. They did it for a specific slice of the population. I'm in it. Many of you are in it. So now you can afford to buy my book when we get out of here. <laughs> um. I'd just like to say thank you for coming and for uh, providing a voice to a group of people in this community specifically that hasn't had one in the past. Uh, so my question is that I know that I will have been and will continue to be seen as a permanent foreigner, as you have said. Um, but what can I and other young Latinos do to not hold resentment towards that title and towards the repercussions of that title, especially as, as, as I'm seeing that DACA is being attempted to be repealed and that TPS has gone to shambles, what can I do to uh, just not fall in this hole of resentment that many of my, uh, my fellow um, peers have, have done so already? Um, I, I don't want to make this sound too simple, but there's a, luckily, from the added wisdom of being like 43 years older than you, I didn't do it overnight, but you just got to let it go. You can't marinate in your resentment of the attitudes of your fellow Americans because you can't change them. 
All that's going to change them is the example that you set as a citizen, as a neighbor, as a worker, as a friend. It's the best you can do. Whether they hold on to that stuff is on them. You have limited control over that permanent foreignness. When I got hired by the PBS NewsHour in 1999, I got letters at, PB, at the NewsHour headquarters saying that I was an affirmative action hire after 23 years in the news business. I was still an affirmative action hire. Now look, I could either have gotten all crazy and angry and torn up the node or anything. I sat there in my office, there were many of them, there wasn't just one. And I just said, well, you know, my check spends. I'm gonna live a nice life while they sit and stew in their resentment. They can't do what I do. They haven't done what I've done, and I can't change who they are. If you learn that earlier rather than later, you'll be a happier guy. <laughs> so that's my gift to you. Great, thank you very much. That was terrific.